Hi, everybody, and welcome to the Building for Digital Equity event. These Building for Digital Equity events is an educational series of live stream events, as well as a podcast to inform and debate digital inclusion efforts. The series uses both interviews and events to explore solutions and share lessons learned by the people who are working towards digital equity. Today's event is hosted by Institute for Local Self-Reliance and the National Digital Inclusion Alliance. We are excited to present new data tools and strategies to simplify complicated issues with a focus on fostering meaningful action and advocacy. The Building for Digital Equity events live streams are sponsored by Utopia Fiber, which is the largest open access fiber network in the nation. My name is Pamela Rosales, pronouns she, they, and I am the Training and Community Engagement Manager with the National Digital Inclusion Alliance, or NDIA. NDIA advances digital equity by supporting community programs and equipping policymakers to act. We advocate for broadband access, tech devices, digital skills training, and tech support. And today, NDIA has over 1,300 affiliates, including 18 tribal entities and organizations in all 50 states, the District of Columbia, Puerto Rico, and the U.S. Virgin Islands. I will be your MC for today. Okay. I found this on the web for his used both interviews. Um, I'm getting some weird audio over here, but we'll figure that out. <laughs> that was awesome. Uh, I just want to say that I feel like Pamela's flexing on me. ILSR has one affiliate. That's us. Uh, 1300, pretty impressive. Um, I'm Christopher Mitchell at the Institute for Local Self-Reliance. I am the program director of the Community Broadband Networks Initiative, and I use he, him pronouns. Um, I'm excited to be here as well. This is, I believe, our fourth event like this. We're always looking for feedback, so we will be asking you to complete a brief survey at the end. We will take it seriously, and to prove that, I will be less jokey this time around because some people thought it was a little too jokey last time. So we're going to focus on having really great material and having fun, but perhaps a little less uh, immature humor, perhaps. Um, I'll do my best. The uh, way to communicate with us uh, during the show and to ask questions, it is best to use the YouTube uh, channel. Uh, so if you are watching on YouTube and you submit a comment, uh, we will be monitoring for that and uh, try to work those questions in as best we can. Some presentations have abilities to answer questions and some uh, do not due to timing. So uh, we will do our best, though, to address questions as they pop up. Also, my camera's glitching. Uh, Logitech is not a sponsor of this. I've gone through like three of these cameras. It's driving me a little bit crazy. Sorry about that. Um, and uh, also, if you're on a different channel, if you're watching this on Twitter or Facebook or LinkedIn or something, uh, and you want to post something using the hashtag B4DE, pound B4DE, that would be wonderful. Uh, we will do our best to try to collect those comments as well. But putting comments in on YouTube is probably the best way to do it. So with that, let's get a little forecast of what we're looking at, Pamela. Awesome. So our agenda for the next 75 minutes starts off with our very first Affordable Connectivity Program, or ACP for short, Lightning Rounds. We are going to have three speakers share their organization's outreach strategies with ACP and how they increased ACP enrollment in their communities. Afterwards, we'll have Dr. K. Edie with the Southern, Black, Southern Rural Black Women's Initiative to talk about their new telemedicine report titled Increased Wellness and Economic Return of Universal Broadband Infrastructure and share their new online calculator. Then we'll share an interview with Sam Musgrave and Devin Weaver from Project Waves on their efforts to bridging the digital divide in Baltimore. And afterwards, we'll have Tanya Emery with Maine Connectivity Authority to come and share Maine's unique approach in developing their state digital equity plan. Afterwards, we're going to have our much anticipated keynote speaker, Angela Siefer, the executive director of the National Digital Inclusion Alliance, to share the digital equity priorities that advocates and digital inclusion organizations should focus on this summer. And we'll close off our event with Michael Weiser to share about radar devices. And of course, we'll sprinkle in fun trivia questions throughout the event where you'll learn more about the Affordable Connectivity Program, Telehealth, and the Digital Equity Act. Excellent. I'm looking forward to the trivia questions. Uh, we, uh, we're going to talk about uh, the ACP first, the Affordable Connectivity Program, which I think we'll might, we might note a few times if you're not familiar with the ACP dashboard. I highly recommend that, acpdashboard.com, for a lot of information about uh, the ACP program, including uh, forecasts of when it will run out of funds. Um, that program currently provides a discount of up to $30 per month toward internet service 
service for eligible households. Uh, there's a lot of eligible households, more than one in three U.S. households uh, qualify. Uh, basically people that are involved with another poverty related program. Uh, but the discount is actually $75 a month on tribal lands. Uh, although I'll just note that the FCC doesn't always do a great job and these businesses don't always do a great job of honoring that or agreeing about what tribal lands are. So um, just hold that in reserve for future conversations. Um, but eligible households can also re uh, receive a one-time discount for up to $100 to purchase a uh, device like a laptop, a desktop computer, uh, from providers that choose to. Um, I guess one last thing I would just say is watch out for scammers and make sure that people you're working with know to watch out for scammers because there are scammers out there trying to get people to take devices and that's uh, actually something that is counterproductive. So um, let me toss it back over to Pamela though to jump into our lightning rounds discussing an ACP program. Yes, and before we start those lightning rounds, we've got our first trivia question for y'all. So, as of today, which state has the highest ACP enrollment? Do you think it's A, Ohio, B, California, or C, Louisiana? You could type your answer in the comment section or just think it in your head. Now, highest, by highest, do you mean the most people involved or the, or the highest share of people by what we think is the eligible population? Um, if that is how people are determining their answer, I don't want to say yes or no because I I'm want just to saying California's got a lot of people in it. So true, but that doesn't necessarily mean that's the highest um, enrollment. True. So, so who is it? All right. So um, the answer is C, Louisiana. If you guessed right, congrats. According to the ACP dashboard created by ILSR, Louisiana has the highest ACP enrollment at 48.6%. And you can access that dashboard by visiting acpdashboard.com. So first up with these ACP lightning rounds, we have a video from Candace Browdy with Connect Lake County to share their ACP outreach tips that they use to spread awareness in the northern suburbs of Illinois. Hi, I'm Candace Browdy, Executive Director of Connect Lake County, coming to you from the northern suburbs of Illinois to talk about ACP outreach. It's critical that you get information about the ACP out into your communities. Create flyers and door hangers with very specific contact information for your community. Make them double sided, one side English, one side in another language. Then partner with local organizations that agree to distribute your flyers to their constituents. Food banks can add a flyer to a bag of groceries. Local housing authorities can send a flyer with monthly rent statements. Set up info tables at grocery stores, in community centers, at health fairs, at school resource centers, and local libraries. Build trust with residents by partnering with community-based organizations. When they invite you into their space, their constituents are more likely to trust you. Explain to residents that ACP is not free internet, it's a federal benefit that eligible residents can take advantage of to reduce their internet expense. Be prepared to answer questions about the legitimacy of the ACP and how the program can benefit households. If residents have not had access to home internet, they might not understand why they need it or how it differs from having internet on their phone. Make sure you're well-versed in the ACP enrollment process. Watch the videos, and read all of the information shared by FCC and USAC. Your residents should feel that they are in capable hands. You may even consider creating naming conventions for ACP enrollment login and passwords so that if a community member forgets their information, you can easily remind them. Host ACP info sessions so residents know in advance what information they need for the process. Explain that the name on the ACP application must match the name of the person whose name is on the internet bill. If using housing assistance to qualify, make sure that rental agreements include the HUD logo. CEP letters from school districts must follow very specific guidelines. I highly recommend including Education Superhighway in your school outreach initiatives. Their services are at no cost and their dedicated staff can help you and your partner school districts leverage existing resources. 
Schedule one-on-one -on -one enrollment support sessions in one hour increments. You don't want to be rushed. And remember, you're not just helping residents enroll in the ACP, you're helping them apply their benefit to an ISP plan. Create information packets that explain the various internet plans in your communities and the advantages of each. Make phone calls with your residents, be their advocate, and then follow up to make sure the ACP benefit has been applied to the plan. And then again, when it's time for recertification, Create detailed tracking forms so that you know where your residents are at each step in the process. Use the time with your residents to talk about their device needs and digital literacy skills. You might not be doing work in those areas right now, but you might in the future, and this way you'll have their information handy. And finally, don't get discouraged. This work is tedious and sometimes it can be very frustrating. Remind yourself that you are empowering your community members and this work takes time. And you're not in this alone. If you haven't already joined the NDIA listserv and surround yourself with like-minded organizations and individuals. We're in this together and you got this. Awesome. Thank you so much, Candace Browdy, for sharing those useful tips. I also know that Connect Lake County has also used digital navigators to help with that. Next up, we have Natalie Bettenker and Amira Bartholomew with the Center for Digital Equity at Queen's University. Hello, I'm Natalie Bettenker. I'm a Deputy Director at the Center for Digital Equity here at Queen's University of Charlotte. And I'm Amira Bartholomew, one of the Program Directors for the Center for Digital Equity here at Queen's University of Charlotte. We're so glad uh, to be here with you through this video just to share a little bit about who we are here at the CDE, as we refer to it, as well as some of our efforts around the Affordable Connectivity Program. So just a little bit about what we do. Here at the CDE, we are a backbone organization for a collective impact strategy. We focus on making Mecklenburg County the most digitally equitable community in America. How do we do this? We bring together uh, community members, we bring together private sector, we bring together public sector and nonprofit organizations to really co-create solutions that help our community members thrive in today's modern culture. Our digital navigation service is the one of the first in the country that's countywide, meaning that we collaborate with the city and anyone in Mecklenburg County can dial 311 press any key and ask to speak to a digital navigator. That is part of what we leverage um, in order to create awareness and truly connect people to the affordable connectivity program. We also connect them to different resources, obviously like a uh, low cost device, digital literacy, uh, technical support at no cost to them. Uh, but really one of our main focus right now is around the affordable connectivity program. So we do this through our digital navigation program where we support individuals, not only in raising awareness of the program, but actually through the application itself. We partner uh, with other, um, other entities that are trusted in the community, such as the libraries. Most recently, they were distributing laptops at different events. And so what we did is we ensured that our digital navigators and volunteers were on site to not only create awareness, but once again, actually walk people through the application process on site. The other thing we're doing is we do individualized campaigns with other trusted partners in the community. Most recently, we actually uh, are transitioning to the next phase of a campaign we did with the school district. And Amira is going to give us a little bit of information behind how we did that, what approach did we take, and what the impact was. Amira? Absolutely. Thank you, Natalie. So as she just mentioned, we did work with the Star Charlotte Mecklenburg School System, first starting off with their senior leadership, figuring out what the opportunities are and how can we best serve their students. So the next thing that we did is with their help, we determined that um, about 31% of students in Charlotte Mecklenburg schools automatically qualify for the Affordable Connectivity Program. This is because they attend a CEP school or a Community Eligibility Provision School. This means that 50% or more of students that attend this school 
received federal reduced cost lunch. So outside of just those CEP schools, which there are 68 of here in Charlotte Mecklenburg, there are also students who attend other schools who also qualify because they received that federal reduced cost lunch. And so in total, we saw about 49% of students in CMS schools automatically qualify. So the way that we went about providing awareness to these folks and their families was first off, those 68 schools, each student in all of those schools received a flyer about the Affordable Connectivity Program that was sent back home with them in their backpacks. So the flyer told them about the Affordable Connectivity Program as well as provided a link to our landing page that we created here at the CBE so that anyone in this campaign can get to this landing page and both go through the process themselves and go ahead and sign up for the Affordable Connectivity Program or reach out to one of our digital navigators through that 311 or that campaign page. And so our digital navigators then reach back out to those families and help them through that process. We're really excited about the campaign and we're able to have an adoption rate here in Charlotte of 46% of people who are eligible for the Affordable Connectivity Program have adopted the program. So that is uh, a little bit larger than the, na the nation's um, going great right now, which is at about 33%. So we're really excited about that. Thank you so much uh, for the time today. Uh, we are here once again, just to remind you uh, to make Mecklenburg County the most digitally equitable community in America. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out. We're happy to expand on the efforts and thank you. Wonderful. Um, I want to introduce next Meg Koifer, who uh, I've had the privilege of interviewing twice now uh, on our building or on our community broadband networks mm -hmm. uh, podcast, uh, community broadband bits podcast, which is available on all kinds of platforms. Mm -hmm. Meg was episode 500. And then uh, I believe Meg was the first episode of the building for digital equity series that we just launched, which is also available on all kinds of platforms if you want to get a sense of some of the work. Uh, but we have a short in, uh, look into it right now. Uh, so Meg with uh, STEM Alliance, do you want to jump in, please? Yeah, I'm happy to. I'm going to try to share screen. Let's see if this works and if there are any problems, I think I have some backup. Um, so let's go here. Great. Are you all seeing my screen now? Yes, it looks good. Wonderful. Great. So I'm Meg Koifer. I work in Westchester County, New York, and I'm the president of the STEM Alliance. The STEM Alliance has been actively enrolling people in ACP, serving hundreds um, since uh, last fall even already. And what I really want to talk about is that our perspective on ACP outreach and enrollment is about relationships. We believe this work is really relationship driven. I'm going to move fast, um, but you can always reach me at um, info at thestemalliance.org if you want more details. First of all, we have a um, very articulated digital navigator process that we built off of advising from NDIA. So our digital navigators, folks who are trained, go out in the field, they work with clients one-to-one, -one, they evaluate their needs, talk about solutions, and if they have internet need, then the primary solution is ACP. We also then can take them through an exit survey and follow-up metrics as well. So the way that we approach clients is that many people have what we call analog inertia. They might not be digitally engaged at all. And some just don't have the time to enroll in ACP. I don't think any of us really enjoy talking to our internet service providers either. So one, these are some of our top of the line approaches. First, we do all of our outreach through trusted partners. Those would be other local organizations or nonprofits who already have the relationships with the clients. Second, when we write grants, we invest in marketing. We're kind of unapologetic about the fact that this program has to be marketed. Um, second, our third, obviously peer-to-peer -peer referral is most powerful. So we encourage the people that we have served to tell other people. Um, and then fourth, we work on piggybacking with other programs. So if one of our partners is running a language class or a workforce training, then we come in literally a couple hours before that or on an extended day for that same program. Then we always work to meet clients where they are, both in time and location. So we bring our work to them uh, as much as possible and heeding the advice of those trusted partners. And then most critical is that we get the client facing social workers in these partner organizations first to be on board about how Internet access is a super social determinant of all the things that they're trying to do for their clients. 
And then second, to really rep ACP in their language with the clients. So what have been the struggles or mixed return at approaches versus high success? Um, we've had mixed return. We thought that working in affordable housing was going to be great. It's had some challenges um, uh, in terms of paid print marketing. We thought really gritty, kind of like literally we printed on pizza boxes and coffee cups that they could contact us for ACP help. We don't think we got great return on that. It's also very hard to track. Uh, then some of our community partners, we talk about having good dance partners. Well, sometimes if that community partner isn't great, we've had to make decisions to walk away and work with the ones who are really effective. And then last, um, this idea of postcard follow-up, we thought sometimes if we went to big festivals and there were a lot of people there that, uh, you know, we didn't want to bother people at that moment. So we would follow up, did not work. When you have them, you need to work with them at that moment. Um, or you will likely not, they will likely not pick up again and talk with you. Uh, high return being in the Department of Social Services lobbies, many of the pieces of evidence that they need in order to enroll ACP, they can get those pieces of paper right there in that building. Um, federally qualified healthcare centers, very high traffic, often the target audiences that we're looking to speak with. And um, generally speaking, folks also have a lot of waiting time, just like in the Department of Social Services. So you can kind of get their attention for a few minutes. Um, we had talked or you heard about CEP, that stands for Community Eligible Provision School Districts. Everybody in the school district by definition qualifies. If you can get the right letter written and sent out, then that serves as a very, very powerful piece of evidence for them to get their ACP eligibility. Peer-to-peer -peer referrals we talked about and posters in key community locations. Um, on the peer-to-peer -peer piece, we are learning that we really need to tell the stories to expand the peer-to-peer. -peer. So peer-to-peer -peer shouldn't just be verbal. We really want to build and we're working on building stronger storytelling, short form video, short content, um, social media. People should be talking to other people about why it's been beneficial to them, the people that we've served, not myself. Um, be ready to scale. We've built an entire client relationship software platform. NDIA is talking more and more about um, open source uh, you know, spreadsheets or ways, just be ready to scale because um, we really believe that our clients deserve high quality services. And if you don't like calling a call center and getting a different person every time, neither will they, and they won't stick to the ACP process. So tracking your client relationships is very important. Big picture, build relationships with clients where they are and through trusted partners. Be ready for scale. Um, because all people deserve quality assistance that reinforces those positive relationships. And finally, tell the story, the story that's in their words um, with those you've already reached in order to advance peer referral. That's it. Thank you, Meg. That was a lot of terrific information uh, from someone who's out there doing the work. So uh, really appreciate you dropping by. Uh, just want to thank all of our lightning round presentations. Those do, in do indeed feel like lightning. Uh, I really appreciate also um, uh, Candice as well as Natalie and Amira for uh, sharing that. And uh, this is where I'm actually going to hand it back to Pamela, but uh, we might have a glitch here. Are you there, Pamela? Yes, I'm right here. Okay. Your video is not, but I'm glad your voice is. Okay. Go for it. Oh no! I'm sorry. I'm actually introducing um, the next uh, the next uh, one. Well, you know, you would think that I would be a little bit better at this after all this practice. Um, the uh, Southern Rural Black Women's Initiative is a terrific uh, organization that the Institute for Local Self Reliance has worked with uh, for many years down in uh, Georgia, Alabama, and Mississippi in the Black Belt. Um, we are uh, just we've just finished uh, a report, published it last month uh, about telemedicine, telehealth and the savings and comparing that to the cost of digital equity, which includes both uh, high quality networks being available to everyone, as well as everyone being able to use them in an effective manner. Uh, that report, uh, I think, is is very exciting and uh, we wanted to share with it. So we've invited Rai, uh, who is our producer behind the scenes uh, to come on, along with Dr. K. Eady, who is a community organizer. Uh, I saw Dr. K. in the chat hanging out, but I am afraid that the poor connectivity in her area may have delayed her. So we'll keep an eye uh, on see if she's able to come back in. But uh, Rai, why don't you start, please? Sure. Sounds good. Uh, so Chris mentioned this report that we just finished and released last week. Uh, the link should go in the chat shortly here. 
Uh, my name is Ryan Marcatilio. I'm an associate director for research at ILSR working on broadband. Uh, so this is a report that looked at 10 rural counties across three states, Alabama, uh, Georgia, and Mississippi. It covered about a quarter of a million people, uh, representing rough annual healthcare spending of about $3 billion. And just to give you a sense of uh, need in these areas, in two of the 10 counties in the report, not a single household had access to what we would all consider to be basic broadband service, uh, equivalent to what you can get in any regular sized town or city in the US today. Uh, similarly, about one in five households across all 10 counties both bring in less than 25,000 a year uh, in annual income and do not have health insurance. And so we're talking about telehealth uh, savings, which the report lays out. Uh, telehealth delivery generally uh, facilitates savings in two ways. Uh, the first is increased efficiency, and the second is completely avoided costs. So in terms of in increased efficiency, we're talking about things like getting radiology images back cheaper and more quickly. In terms of avoiding costs altogether, we're talking about more regular monitoring of uh, of heart uh, of heart surgery to eliminate unnecessary readmissions. And so, for the report, we landed on five high impact areas where telehealth can save uh, can save money. These were admissions and readmissions, uh, emergency department visits, lost productivity, and uh, and driving costs. And so, after running the numbers based on existing hospital use and uh, reported days of sickness each year, we projected in the report that robust telehealth delivered over reliable and universal broadband would result in $43 million in savings each year across the 10 counties. About half of that came from lost productivity caused by illness, uh, and then emergency department visits, readmissions, and admissions. Uh, it totals $850 million in total savings over 20 years. And it sounds like a lot of big numbers, but uh, in actuality, they were pretty conservative. Uh, something like 30 to 50 percent of, of all heart failure patients get readmitted to the hospital within 30 days of having their surgery. In fact, it's the single largest contributor of hospital readmissions nationwide, and they cost fifteen thousand uh, dollars on average apiece. Uh, but pilot programs have shown that as many as 75 percent of all readmissions could be avoided with good telehealth programs. In the report, we just calculated 10 percent. Of avoidable. Uh, hey, right. I just want to make sure you knew that Dr. K. E. D. is with us. Hi, Kay. How's it going? I'm fine. Thank you. We lost power. I apologize. Great to have you back. Um, so I'll, I'm going to pass to, to Kay in just a second, but I wanted to uh, close by mentioning that. So we found that uh, we could save over $40 million a year across all 10 counties, but, and, and this is huge, but in order to do it, uh, we need the infrastructure to develop uh, those telehealth and deliver those telehealth programs. There were 90,000 households in the report. Uh, two thirds of those needed the infrastructure to do it. But the good news is that over 20 years, the infrastructure would pay for itself 10 times over just through the telehealth savings. Uh, so I wanna pass it to Kay to talk a bit about a series of regional meetings that she helped orchestrate and attend and run, which drove not only why we did the report in the first place, but why it matters for individuals and beyond the abstract. Okay. Thank you so much, Ra. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dr. Kay Eady. I'm a community organizer for the Southern Rural Black Women's Initiative. My work spans the rural communities of Southwest Georgia. There were a total of 10 meetings and events that were held to promote, discuss, and advocate for telehealth in, in the rural communities in Southwest Georgia. The meetings range from local board meetings, PTA meetings, health fairs, workshops, and church events. Attendance varied at each event. Church events, workshops, uh, first Fridays were the top contenders for attendance. On average, there were about 10 to 15 people that signed the roster at each event. Women dominated in attendance, flanked by young adults as well as, as young men. Local government officials, educators, clergy, healthcare workers, and other private citizens were frequent in attendance. I remember distinctly how one senior citizen stated that she never thought that she would see the day when she could visit her doctor over the telephone. She went on to tell me that this type of appointment was so important to her because she had no means of getting to and fro from the doctor. I asked her if she would continue this type of appointment in the future, and she assured me that she would. A recent 
a frequent topic of discussion during these events was broadband. Many said that they would have more telehealth appointments if broadband was available in their area. This discussion solidified the fact that there's a direct correlation between access to care, telehealth, and broadband services in rural communities. In our report, We Need Access on Ending Preventable Death and Cervical Cancer 2022, women consistently reported that barriers existed that prevented them from getting care. And one of these barriers was broadband. The women of Southwest Georgia consistently reiterated that telehealth can provide needed medical care or visits to their physicians, but other barriers were in place. These powerful women said that everyone should have access to health care via telehealth, via telehealth or any other form, and that this should not be a barrier because of their zip code. Ms. Mary M. bellowed loudly to me that telehealth should be an option for everyone, regardless of their zip code at all. I thank you all so much. Thank you very much, Kate. Uh, yep. We built an online calculator to go along with the report. It lives at srbwihealthcalculator.org, and it lets you calculate the numbers for your own community. Thank you all. So those resources are coming fast and furious. Um, we will be sending out a email afterward to uh, make sure you can catch up with those. Uh, but thank you very much, Dr. Edie. Uh, I look forward to checking in again soon with you. Um, and uh, one of the things that we see across um, uh, a variety of populations in rural areas and uh, uh, especially on, on tribal lands is that electricity disruptions are a significant challenge uh, in delivering people high quality internet access and having them using it. So uh, kind of a real life demonstration there of, uh, of what we see. Um, so thank you, Rye and uh, Dr. Edie, uh, for sharing the, the telemedicine, um, the perspective. Um, and I think now we're going to be moving into uh, a similar thing, which is basically we were just talking about the need for better infrastructure and digital equity in um, rural areas and how that can be paid for. But now we can talk a little bit about an urban approach that is uh, one that is also financially uh, viable that uh, has been enacted. So I'll pass it off to Pamela for the introduction for Project Waves. Yes, Um, and just to give a preview about what's coming up, we're gonna have that interview from Project Waves. And then after that, we're gonna have Tanya Emery to share a main strategy with developing their state digital equity plan. After that, we'll have our keynote speaker, Angela Seifer, to share priorities that the digital... Michael Weiser to share radar devices. Um, And with Project Waves, um, before we start with that, we do have a other trivia question that we wanna ask. Um, And it's going to be regarding the BEAD program, the Broadband Equity Access and uh, Deployment Program. So um, if we could have that question put up, Awesome. The Broadband Equity Access and Deployment Program, BEAD, allocates $42.5 billion for new broadband infrastructure. How quickly could we get a return on that investment with well-run telehealth programs delivered across universal, fast, affordable internet connection to every household? Is so it- you're, you're asking, I mean, so I'm sorry, people are only listening. I should let you read off the answers. Oh, yeah. So do um, you think it's A, 30 years? B, 15 years, C, 10 years, or D, one year. So if we had amazing telehealth programs, how fast could we save $42.5 billion? That's the question. Yeah. I mean, any of those is a bargain, it seems like. (laughs) Yeah. So if you have your answer, we are going to reveal it in three, two, one. The answer is D, one year. There is so much money in healthcare. <laughs> Chris, I believe you have a, a bonus fact to share with everyone. I do. If just one percent of all healthcare spending could be avoided using telehealth, uh, we'd pay for the program in one year. Uh, the bead program, that is. Even efforts directed at a few conditions could return massive benefits. Uh, for instance, there's two that always come to mind for me, uh, the highest cost ones. Uh, one of those is diabetes. That affects one in 10 Americans, and it accounts for one quarter of all healthcare spending. If we were able to use telehealth to effectively reduce the cost of diabetes, 
diabetes care and uh, and minimizing the disruptions to people's lives and things like that, we could save the equivalent of the entire cost of bead in just a few years. That's just if we could make a dent in the problem with diabetes. So um, there's a few conditions that we could have a tremendous return on investment on with uh, telehealth. But in order for that, we need to have high quality networks and digital equity to make sure that we can take advantage of it. Uh, so Next up, we have Sam Graves, who uh, is uh, and Devin Weaver of Project Waves. We visited them in Baltimore, uh, me as well as Emma and Sean on my team. We had a great time and we wanted to share uh, what they're doing. But uh, we're trying to keep all the presentations tight. So we're going to share the first few minutes of, of an interview that Sean did with them. Uh, I edited it, and my editing skills are not so great. So a little bit of grace there would be terrific. But we have the full uh, interview up on YouTube for people that want to catch more of it. We try to get the best details there in the beginning. And we will share that link uh, in a follow-up email for everyone who registered. Or just stay tuned because we're going to put it out on our social media channels uh, as well. Um, but um, Project uh, Waves uh, is focused in Baltimore on connecting uh, people in uh, low-income, uh, federally assisted housing, uh, I believe. is the, I always get confused with the housing stuff, but um, it is all people who qualify for ACP in the housing. So you'll hear that in this interview uh, right in here in a second, but they've connected more than 300 households already to free high-speed service within their living units. Project Waves is a nonprofit internet service provider located in Baltimore City. Uh, as an ACP provider, we provide free to the user high speed home broadband service, uh, primarily to residents living in affordable housing communities, uh, primarily MGUs or apartment buildings. I'll get started by just saying we did build a network. Uh, we, we partner with a local fiber optic provider uh, who does kind of business class services uh, for, for businesses across Baltimore City um, early on in the pandemic. Um, and they realized that they had so much latent capacity on their network and they weren't really interested in getting into the residential service marketplace. Um, and so through our partnership with this local provider, Light Cloud Hosting, uh, we actually have access to a pretty robust uh, fiber ring throughout Baltimore City uh, that allows us to deliver service to these multi-dwelling unit properties that are currently on the network. And you could have, as an organization, decided to just strictly focus on enrolling residents in the Affordable Connectivity Program, but you decided to build a network. Why, why didn't you just say, let's just sign people up for ACP? What, why, why build this network? Why serve as an internet service provider in addition to ACP enrollment? That's a great question. There are a few reasons, but the biggest one I'd say most primarily is that the time is now. Um, I know like everybody that in the audience probably understands that the capital investments in broadband expansion have hit a historic high. We are experiencing a once in a lifetime um, opportunity to really leverage those types of capital investments through programs like ARPA, uh, the American Rescue Plan Act, um, and upcoming bead funding to really change the dynamic of what infrastructure looks like in cities like Baltimore. Uh, in particular, in cities like Baltimore, where a de facto monopoly or duopoly exists uh, with like one or two large incumbents, uh, becoming responsible for serving every household. Um, we're really pushing like creation of like innovative pathways to push market competition. So for us, when we're delivering gig speed service to affordable housing communities, that really begs the question of why isn't gig speed service more ubiquitously and affordably available throughout the city? Um, so it's a, it's a couple of reasons, but the biggest two are that the time is now, and uh, this is what part of, uh, this is a huge piece of the digital equity lens and the approach to ensuring that we're holding incumbent providers uh, kind of accountable for, for what they're delivering to, to customers throughout communities. Now, Devin, you actually built the network. Tell us how, tell us how and, and how you put it together and, and what it's delivering today. Sure. Um, I inherited the network right as we began our first MDU project at uh, Jonathan Square. Um, and it was done using wireless access points in the hallway. Uh, it took a long time to build out and it resulted in variable levels of service for our users, depending on um, their location in the building in relation to an access point. Um, and we had several other properties coming up and I just couldn't stand the uh, the thought of doing an, another building using that method. Um, and that's when I came across um, Positron's G.HN um, access multiplexer product. 
um, in which you can reuse uh, existing coax wirings or phone or phone lines or, or whatever's available in the building um, with this product to deliver gig speeds over um, over those wires to uh, to individual units. Um, this allowed us to uh, to take deployment time down to you know we 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 can get you know an, an easy building done within you know a week or two, <laughs> um, uh, and also and also you know resulted in uh, equitable service for everybody. Everybody gets their own you know gig speed router and their own gig speed connection. And this required that you got fiber to the building and then use the existing wiring in in these buildings, correct? Yep. So the, um, as Sam mentioned earlier, the uh, fire fire that we've been working with is named uh, Light Cloud. Um, but uh, de depending on you know the deployment on the product, you know, we, we might have to get it through some other provider like Com or, um, Verizon, Comcast, or Zayo, or whoever else. Um, but yeah, and those pipes are uh, 10 gigs to each building. 10 gigs to each building. And now, and you're serving how many buildings now? Uh, so we are now up to what's going on six, seven buildings right. now. Yeah, we're at in six lit live, um, and we're building out uh, fiber to an additional sixteen properties at this moment. So, yeah. Oh my goodness! And so right now you're serving how many units? Uh, about a thousand households. About a thousand households, and that and these uh, individual tenants uh, uh, in these units, they're getting the service at no cost. Correct. Exactly. Because we're an ACP provider, um, and, and I get into that a little bit, uh, the ACP is, is actually one of the qualification pathways to receiving the $30 per month subsidy from the Affordable Connectivity Program is if you live in subsidized housing. So 100% of our customers are actually ACP eligible. What we do is really deploy a team of customer service specialists, ACP wizards, so to speak, uh, on the ground in these properties who really interface with residents and help them get registered for the ACP prior to receiving affordable connectivity program service from Project Waves. So the first step is really sitting down, kind of familiarizing residents to the affordable connectivity program, um, providing them that in-person assistance with completing the application. Uh, as you know, like many customers who are experiencing uh, struggles with digital skills just may not have an email address or may never have uploaded a document online. We'll need that help to really ensure that they're able to participate in the affordable connectivity program. Once they're enrolled, uh, we provide connectivity within 24 hours. Uh, we deploy our technicians to the property and ensure that the customer gets connected. During that time, we also ensure that every Wi-Fi enabled device in the customer's home is connected and that they understand how to recognize their network on devices like smartphones, tablets, smart TVs, um, and that they have their password easily documented, our contact information so that they can text or call us if they need assistance. So that interview continues on YouTube and highly recommend it. The, the folks in um, Baltimore there and Project Waves are doing a great job. Uh, I want to thank uh, both Sam and Devin for uh, doing that interview with us, as well as their great work. And Sean did a profile on Devin and how he got into this work uh, on Community Nets that I believe will be shared in the chat soon. And we'll include that in the uh, wrap up uh, email that we'll send out to people who registered. Um, but I uh, highly recommend digging more into that solution, which uh, they've really uh, done a great job pioneering and making work. Um, so we are now going to move on to our next uh, presentation. Uh, but I wanted to take a second uh, to note that Angela is coming up. Um, this is uh, planned to be a 75-minute uh, event. So uh, Angela will be coming up uh, after this uh, next presentation, I believe, and we'll carry on a little bit past the top of the hour and we'll continue and wrap up around uh, 4.20 Eastern time. So that is the schedule that we are working with and um, looking forward to continuing to address um, you know, questions as they come in and that sort of a thing as best we can. Pamela, would you like to introduce our next presenter, please? Yes, so we are very excited to have Tanya Emery here with Maine Connectivity, who's going to share Maine's unique strategy in developing their state digital equity plan. Tanya, passing it over to you. Thank you so much. Glad to be with you both this afternoon. Um, I am very pleased to be in a position where we can tell everybody a little bit about the work that we've done to create Maine's digital equity plan, uh, which coincidentally, the approach that we've taken is the approach that we've also taken to create our bead plan. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And if this doesn't work, I'm going to have uh, the good folks behind me help. There we go.
Okay. Um, very quickly to walk folks through our timeline. We are um, right now just entering the June timeframe. Um, obviously, we, I think, are all taking a, at the Maine Connectivity Authority, which is the Maine State Broadband Office, taking a much needed uh, breath of fresh air um, as we have come out of our drafting period. So um, our approach to creating a bead plan and a digital equity plan um, as a state broadband office was instead of doing two separate stakeholder engagement periods, um, was to say, you know what, we have to do this um, and we want to do two plans, but we really want digital equity to be at the core of our infrastructure plan because everything that we do should be guided um, by the priority of helping to catch up those that have been left behind um, by the decisions that have been made previously, um, by uh, the, the infrastructure that has been built so far, um, which has impacted uh, those covered populations and those important audiences. And so we wanted that digital equity core to be the center of our broadband action plan. And so we decided rather than doing two separate planning processes to do one planning process. And so we created a structure that was led by an engagement period, which was February, March and April of this year. Um, we then had a draft period in May. Uh, June is what we call our reflections and revisions. I'll talk a little bit about that later. And then in July, uh, we'll, we'll sort of go over all of that reflection and revision uh, material that we've collected from the public. And we will do our revisions in July and we will submit to NTIA by the 1st of August. The engagement period uh, really was intense. Um, we had all of our staff members crisscrossing the state, um, which Maine is not a big state uh, compared to some of the other states in the country. Um, but for us, it's big. And we really wanted to be in every part of the state talking to um, every type of neighborhood group, community group, um, covered population, and using a lot of different modalities to have conversations with people. Um, we started a process, Maggie Drummond Ball, who's our strategic partnerships director, who many of you in the digital equity community probably know, uh, started a model which is a program called Regional and Tribal Broadband Partners. And that model was to have 13 partner organizations throughout the state covering all the territories of our state to say, these are our sort of folks on the ground. And those partners really helped us know who were the people who were in touch with covered populations and, um, and geographies and people in every nook and cranny of our state so that we could make sure that we knew who to meet with and who could help us understand the opportunities, the challenges, the assets, all of the things that NTIA was asking us to understand for both the BEAD uh, template and also for the digital equity template as well. We did focus groups, we did interviews, those regional and tribal broadband partners helped to amplify our reach. They represented over 180 coalition partners and help us, helped us to go from the interviews that we could have done by ourselves as a staff of you know, less than 20 people to over 651 interviews. Um, we were able to do so much more with their assistance. Uh, stakeholder group meetings, office hours, having dedicated, um, we would get written letters, emails, phone calls. Um, we also did translations of advertising. Uh, we, we did things, we translated our survey. Um, we targeted advertising in non-English speaking um, publications to make sure that we were getting reach out to covered populations um, in some of the places that um, we might not have thought to have looked otherwise had we not been thinking about that really consciously. Okay. Um, also, our tribal consultation process, um, very extensive work to build those relationships with our tribal uh, communities and to get to the point where um, we have very strong relationships, we're able to complete those formal consultations and also really build the strengths of those relationships. So it wasn't just about saying that we had a meeting, it was about building the strength of that relationship to create a sustainable relationship over time and a partnership. Um, also, we engaged the University of Maine uh, Aging Center to work with us on a digital equity asset inventory, which created a structure which will become the foundation of an ongoing asset inventory that will be continuously updated uh, and sort of serves as the template for an online uh, uh, repository for where those things can continue to be updated. We also did strategic um, targeted industry analysis because broadband is such an important asset for economic development for communities. And that's the lens through which a lot of communities started to look at broadband. And that helped to open a lot of conversations about economic development and workforce develop development. We had conversations about capital markets. And also um, we really sort of finished off uh, the entire process 
with a huge digital equity workshop, which had over 100 stakeholders in May. NDIA came, uh, several of the staff members came, and that was an opportunity for people to both celebrate um, and also to take an opportunity to say, hey, out of all of these solutions that we've come up with in our regional plans, we provided a regional template so that each region could come up with their own plan. Um, that regional template had all of the uh, makings that they would be able to come up with a regional plan that had the ingredients so that that would feed into a state plan. Um, those regional plans came up with solutions. Some of those might be appropriate to implement on the regional level. Some of them might be appropriate to be implemented on a state level if those solutions were really seen in many regions. And so at that digital equity workshop, we had the opportunity to have that conversation. We also had an opportunity to celebrate that so many people now are working on digital equity, on, on broadband in the state of Maine, that there have never been so many people working on this in the state of Maine before. I'm sure that's true in many states throughout the country. And it was a nice opportunity to celebrate that milestone. Um, so just a little bit about Reflect and Revise. We really wanted to take the opportunity to present a draft plan. It is now published, both the uh, Broadband Action Plan, which is our BEAD plan, and our Digital Equity Plan. Um, some of the requirements for the BEAD plan are satisfied by the presence of a digital equity plan. So you'll see that they, see that they are very symbiotic. Um, many places in the Broadband Action Plan reference, for example, some places in the, uh, in the asset inventory reference that the full inventory of this is in the digital equity plan, but here are some of the highlights. Um, some of the things that are the, the uh, strategic goals are referenced directly from the digital equity plan, but then they add on those additional infrastructure goals that are in the broadband action plan, but would not be referenced necessarily in the digital equity plan. If you're interested in looking at those, they are available on our website, which is mainconnectivity.org slash planning. And I will, there we go. I've ended my screen share, right? Yes. Okay, and Maine great. is always, Maine has been doing tremendous work. Uh, you have a great group of folks up there, a lot of local organizations that have pulled together. So just yeah. wanted to jump in before Pamela asks you a question. Sure. Yep. Thank you so much, Tanya. We've got just one question for you. Um, what advice do you have for states that are developing their plan to have meaningful stakeholder and partner engagement? So I think one of the things that we learned was that it really was challenging to engage directly with covered populations. Some covered populations were just harder to access directly than others. It was really um, important to us that we, if we tried and we weren't successful, we came back and said, okay, that didn't work. Is there another stakeholder group that might have a better relationship that might be more trusted by this covered population? Let's try and have a conversation with that stakeholder group and see if they're able to access um, that covered population, if they'd be willing to meet with us. Keep trying different strategies, keep trying in different in different geographies, those trusted intermediaries might be different. Keep trying different stakeholder groups. You may not be, especially as a state agency, you may not be the right, the right group to have those direct conversations with those covered populations. They might not have a lot of trust in a state agency. And so those intermediaries may be the right ones to have those conversations. I think that's a really important lesson um, that we needed to hear directly. And that made those relationships with those intermediaries and those regional partners all the more important. And, and it's an important part of the sustainability of, of our work moving forward. I think that's something that is very well reflected in in what I hear as well from states. And so I think, um, uh, again, Maine has a lot of lessons that others can can take away. And uh, I'm glad that you were able to share some of them, but uh, I'm sure that folks can uh, connect with you uh, in order to learn others and ask direct questions as well. Uh, we didn't have any other questions that came in through, through the chat. So uh, we're going to release you and move on to a trivia question, which Tanya, I'm guessing you would know the answer to, but uh, you'll just have to tell us later if you got it right or not. All right, so for our um, other trivia question, um, the administering entity for the Digital Equity Act is selected by which of each state? Is it A, the federal program officer, B, the governor or an equivalent official, C, the state broadband officer? Which one do you think it is? The federal program officer is something you may have heard uh, uh, discussed as the FPO for people who haven't come across that before. Every state has one. A few states are sharing uh, a person, but uh, that's a, a term, if you hadn't heard it before, is comes from there. But uh, Pamela, uh, who who wins? 
Um, if you answered B, you're correct. It is the governor or an equivalent official. So NDIA has developed a state digital equity plan toolkit that provides states with guidance on developing these uh, digital equity plans. You can find that toolkit on our website if you visit digitalinclusion.org. All right. So next up, we have our very much anticipated keynote speaker, Angela Siefer. Angela is the executive director of NDIA and she'll discuss key points that digital inclusion organizations should prioritize this summer. Oh, hello, everyone. Uh, I was trying to get the slide set up. Rai's just gonna do it for me. That'll be a lot easier. <laughs> it's great to be here. Hi, Pamela. Hi, Chris. It's super exciting. I love being part of these events. You all keep things moving so quickly. Uh, Rai, can we pull those slides up? Oh, Chris is maybe gonna do the slides. I'll just start talking, telling you yep, about the Affordable Connectivity Program. Awesome. Uh, the Affordable Connectivity Program uh, has been mentioned a couple of times on the show already today. The really important information we need to make sure everybody understands is that uh, the federal government made a one-time investment into the Affordable Connectivity Program, and that money is going to run out. Currently, expectations, nobody knows for sure, because it depends on you know how many people subscribe, but currently we're estimating spring of 2024, which seems really soon, friends, right? Like that's a little bit scary. So um, what we need to do is have Congress give us another year. Two would be ideal, but we feel like we might be pushing it with two. So give us another year. Um, and so that's the request that really needs to happen this fall. We've been told by those who understand these types of policy decision making better than I do. We've been told it's best if it happens as a writer on something that's already going to happen or an add on something that's definitely going to pass. Um, so that needs to happen this fall so that we can continue the ACP program and signing people up. Uh, there has um, there are, of course, concerns about signing people up for something that may not be ending. So what NDIA is encouraging and many of our affiliates were doing without us even bringing it up is they're just telling folks this could end, this might be a short-term program, but the FCC uh, will make sure that the process is such that folks aren't surprised by it. There will be advanced warning if it does end, but we're gonna work really hard to make sure it doesn't end. So that's our, our job right now. And so the ask for everyone is uh, this summer is to continue doing what a lot of you are already doing, which is helping people sign up for ACP, um, spreading the awareness, and then also sharing those success stories. You know, what, who are the individuals that have been um, influenced and how have their lives changed because they had that $30 or possibly $75 subsidy for their broadband service. Um, and then sharing those success stories, talking to your congressional representatives, making sure they know how it has impacted your community. Uh, if you have some great stories you wanna share, contact the great folks at ILSR or NDIA and we will use our means to distribute those stories. My next topic for you all is the Digital Equity Act. I know we've talked about this continuously, but <laughs> let's keep talking about it a little bit more because um, I had a realization the other day that we've actually, the, the big money hasn't really hit the street, so to speak, right? It's, it's the planning money that's out there right now. And so the actual funds, next slide please, the actual funds that are going to be touching uh, all of these local digital inclusion programs are still en route, one could say. Uh, so if you look at this timeline and kind of head your eyes towards the end of it, um, we're at a place where the states are finishing up their plans. You heard Maine say they're, they already have theirs out for comment. That is not the norm. I, right now, three states have theirs out for comment. And so we expect more of them you know, August kind of time frame. Um, September is when NTIA is supposed to be putting their stamp of approval on all of them. It's possible that a couple might ask for extensions so that, you know, might be extended slightly. But then after that, the states then um, need to apply for their implementation money. In, in these grant terms, it's called capacity funds. And so it's what that purpose of that is for the states to be able to do something with these plans they've created. Um, and those capacity funds are what will allow them to do that. And that's where any relationships that you may have developed with your state broadband office, um, your administering entity, because it's not always the broadband office, is really important because that's how they can determine if there are resources in terms of existing programming that may benefit from additional funds to scale up. 
Um, last piece on this timeline is the competitive grants. So the Digital Equity Act money was divided into three pots. It was the money for the planning, the money for the um, states to do something with that, uh, those plans, and then the money for federal competitive. So the federal competitive will be you and friends get together and figure out how to go after money that you're gonna be competing nationally for. Next slide, please. Uh, so I feel like we've you know repeated these messages a couple of times, but wanna make sure it's really clear to everyone. If you're not already talking to your state broadband office and engaging in their process, they're all doing um, these listening tours where they're out talking to folks, they're doing engaging kind of activities. If you're not, I would encourage you to get on that right away. Uh, the states will get that capacity, those capacity grants. Um, uh, th th I'm sorry, I made a mistake on the slide. They won't get the grants at the end of the summer. They will finalize their plans at the end of the summer and then they will be applying for the grants um, in 2024. Um, so make sure that you're, you're moving on that whole process. Next slide, please. It's a bit of a relief that Angela makes mistakes too. <laughs> Uh, we all make mistakes, Chris. Uh, so summer priorities. We really encourage you, not, if you are going to engage in digital equity work, you may already be doing it or you may think, be thinking about doing it. Don't do it by yourself. Talk to partners. Talk to others in your community. We really need to be working together. This is an all hands on deck type of situation uh, where we address the inequities around um, digital access and use in our communities. So um, if you don't already have a coalition, See if it makes sense to form one. Um, and if you do have one, I, we encourage you to fully participate in that. Um, Internetforall.gov is the Department of Commerce's website, and that's where they have contact information for these Digital Equity Act administering entities, which most are inside a broadband office. Sometimes it's a consultant hired by a broadband office, and sometimes it's a completely separate entity like Idaho's is their state library. Um, participate in those listening sessions and help your, um, your, your administering entity connect with folks who should be part of those listening sessions. So these are the covered populations. So as much as you can help um, the state hear from those who are directly impacted, the better these plans are going to be. Next. Uh, and then I feel like I'm always the, you know, like bringing in the bad news when I bring this up. Uh, lots of folks like to talk about how we're going to solve the digital divide with the BEAD and DEA money. Um, I'm really, really sad to be the person to say that's not going to happen. The current investments are, are not going to bridge the digital divide. They will not magically create digital equity across the United States. But what it will do is give us a chance to create digital inclusion ecosystems where we can keep working on this. Uh, I, I like to remind folks that I don't think NDIA would exist if it hadn't been for BTOP. Like myself, some of the other members of NDIA's team, our experience, most recent experience, was because of BTOP money. And so this by all BTOP, moves us forward. Sorry. You mean, yeah, the program uh, from ancient history, for those of us that were around for it, it started in like 2010, which was out of the uh, stimulus that Obama uh, got through Congress that uh, put $7 billion into broadband. And I don't think it was that ancient, Chris. Oh, <laughs> I was, actually, I was, pregnant with my uh, youngest child when I was writing and helping write a grant proposal for Connect Your Community and her 13th birthday was the other day. So that's how long ago it was. Um, and then just a note that we really need more dedicated funding for digital equity in general, but specifically for tribal entities in US territories, because otherwise they kind of get lost in the mix. Next. And then lastly, if you're not already a member of the NDIA community, we welcome you to join. Uh, there's just really a lot going on within the community where folks can talk to each other. And we really think that's where the big learning occurs. That's where NDIA's learning occurs. The team, our team members and the full community is from each other. Can I just ask you a quick, Angela, off um, off the cuff? I think a lot of people think of NDIA as like, hey, y'all do digital inclusion. But like, just just give us the 30 seconds. What does NDIA actually do? Right. That's a great question. Uh, so NDIA, National Digital Inclusion Alliance. Uh, we are now a team of 18 about to, to bring on our, our 19th team member. And what we do is help folk, connect folks who do that digital inclusion work on the ground, connect to each other, peer-to-peer -peer networks. We have lots of working groups on specific topics like ACP. 
Um, but then also we learn from all of that. We have guides and toolkits on our website. We really want to touch as many folks as we can. But I think part of the, the uniqueness of NDIA then is the fact that we merge all that local activity with policy advocacy. So and we go to policymakers and explain to them the realities of what's happening on the ground. Sometimes things actually happen like the Digital Equity Act or the um, the equity focus in BEAD. And then we take some of that information that folks are going to know if they're actually running digital inclusion programs lo locally back to the folks on the ground to say, here's how you engage. So kind of the description I just gave, most of my team members could do that. Pamela could tell you just the same things that I told you, right? Because we all understand these different pieces, but we have expertise in the different sections. Awesome, thank you so much, Angela. So Chris and I have a question for you. Um, first is what should digital equity organizations do now to prepare for Digital Equity Act funds? Uh, I think it's a couple of things. It's talking to your fo your partners and your, um, your other members of your digital inclusion ecosystem and your communities so that you can do that work together. Particularly if you're thinking about going after those competitive grant funds, um, having read enough grant applications and been a guest reviewer in enough places, they really don't like if someone thinks that they are a lone hero and they don't have partners that they're working with. So have your partners figure out how you're gonna do things together. Um, but then also I think it's, um, it's making sure that you can think about the sustainability of all this. And I, I hesitate because I don't wanna like lay the, okay, the sustainability is responsibility of whoever is gonna run that digital inclusion program. It is to an extent, but it is also us as a community figuring out sustainability. But I do encourage those who are thinking about these grant funds to think about what data might you collect to help you figure out that sustainability and convince those who should fund it that you have the, uh, you have the, the information to prove to them that your programming was successful. So let me let me start my question with an editorial, <laughs> which is that uh, Congress clearly agrees with us that the market is horribly broken when it comes to internet service, which is why I think they are balking at putting more money into ACP, uh, because I think even people who have far different uh, ideological leanings than any of us, but we each have different leanings to be clear, um, but nonetheless, like everyone agrees that like, it's kind of gross to watch uh, Charter and, and, and the big cable companies pocket so much money or the wireless companies who in many cases aren't doing um, a, a lot. But the ACP is crucial, right? I mean, especially on tribal lands, um, we're, we're putting a ton of money into building networks that uh, may not be financially sustainable absent that continued support. Uh, and so this then leads us to, uh, you know, something that many of us boring people have long known, which is that we need to find a solution at the FCC with universal service. So can you walk us through how important that is? Yeah, and it's complicated too. So the universal service fund is that fee on your phone bills. So everybody, your homework tonight is to go look at a phone bill, your mobile phone bill, which is probably the only one any of it, any of us have left. Go look at that phone bill and look at the universal service fee on it. And where that money goes now is um, to uh, Lifeline, to um, building more networks, right? To E-rate, which is for schools and libraries, uh, to health providers. So there. Right now, there are ways that that money goes out and there's systems for bringing the money in, but the systems for bringing it in is a little bit broken. It was, the system was created in a time when we were using landlines. Uh, we were thinking about the difference between a cross state line or in state. And that's not really how we think about our phone calls and our communication these days. It's not the functionally how it works. So US at you know, the Universal Service Fund has to be updated. We have to change how the money comes in and then probably in that process, we're then gonna change how the money goes out and how it goes out, the affordable connectivity program needs to be included in there. It's very logical. Nobody really argues with this point. The point where there becomes disagreement is where should the funding come from? The big two possible categories, although I'm sure there are lots more, but the two that often get talked about are broadband providers, that there be a fee assessed on your broadband service um, or uh, big tech. So maybe there's fee assessed on uh, the providers that use a lot of bandwidth, like a Netflix, or maybe on the digital ads that we all hate. 
Yes. And so I think if we wrap up uh, the discussion today um, uh, from your your presentation, we have one more for people who are curious. Um, uh, but Angela, two things I take away from yours is that in the short term, we need to build these local coalitions to make sure that we are working on digital equity locally. But I think we also then need to make sure that Congress is hearing uh, that we need to reform the Universal Service Fund. This is something that has been talked about in, uh, again, our, our nerd circles for quite some time. But like Congress is like, cool, we'll push that, punt that down the line because they never hear from constituents about it. But we need to build local power and then start pushing uh, strategically on D.C. to make sure that things happen. S somebody's going to be upset wherever that fee gets assessed somebody's going to be upset. So we all have to be okay with somebody being upset because I don't actually have an opinion where the fee comes from. We just need to make sure that, that, that this program continues because it's so important to folks locally. And yes, we do need to fix those long-term, like it's so expensive and it shouldn't be this expensive. We have to fix that long-term, but in the short term, we can't just be like, sorry, everybody, hold tight. We're going to fix these networks while y'all suffer. So we have to do both at the same time. A lot of work left. Thank you, Angela. Thanks for having me. So we have one final presentation and then we have some wrap up. This presentation uh, comes from Michael Wasser and this is a really cool project. Uh, one of the things that we are running into, uh, whether we're talking about uh, any aspect of digital equity is whether or not people have good connectivity in their homes. And no one knows, the FCC has not bothered to actually produce effective data sources on this. And it's not as easy as you might think uh, to do. Uh, doing the occasional speed test is not rigorously scientific <laughs> to tell us uh, what kind of service we have. So we're going to play this video that talks about a new tool. This is one of, it's not the only one, uh, folks at the University of Chicago are also working on one, uh, but I've had an inside glimpse into, into these radar pods, and I think that it is really cool. So we have a short video explaining an exciting new device that is available, and I'll share how you can get them after we learn a little bit about them. Hi, this is Michael Wasser with Exactly Labs, and I'm going to be one, running us through one of our products right now, which is the Radar Toolkit, which is an open source tool to allow uh, any organization monitor specific internet quality at particular locations. Um, if you want to learn more, you can go to radartoolkit.com. Um, but today I'm going to be looking specifically at the pods experience. So that's at pods.radartoolkit.com and you can sign yourself up there uh, if you'd like. And if you have a physical device with you, um, you'll receive a box something like this, which has an ID on it, which you'll then use to uh, register with your account. Uh, if you don't have a device, you actually can also use a software-based installer, so you don't actually need to get one of these. And when you do get them, you just need to plug it into power and network at that location that you want to monitor, and that's about it. So I'm just going to walk through what that looks like today. So I've already registered with an account, and I'm going to add a new pod. Uh, that's my pod ID that I've previously typed in, and I'm going to call it my first pod. I'm going to give it a location. And you'll see that uh, it, it'll pick up a specific location, but if there's something off about it, like if you're in a rural community, you can just drag that point somewhere else and hit create. And uh, once you're set up, you can view that location over time. Uh, you can also, if you give this pod to someone else, so let's say you're monitoring it on their behalf, um, there's a QR code on the back of the device. So if you scan it, you can see a little bit of context on what data is being gathered. Uh, you can see the download and upload from the most recent test. And then on the website itself, you can go download um, all the tests that have previously happened with this device uh, if they're available. Um, we've also put a lot of effort, and if you're an organization that and you want to give access, help set up another organization, like let's say a school district, you can actually do that on behalf of someone else and just make it a little easier on them. 
Now, once you have a number of these devices out and deployed, uh, you can also get access to a set of dashboards to view these devices over time. Uh, so in this particular view, what we're looking at is a download um, um, medium, maximum, and min across the set of devices we've deployed, or you can even compare two sites to each other. Uh, I always find that I find, uh, I'm always finding unexpected things when I'm looking at these charts. So for example, um, this is the same ISP at a, a consumer and a business location. Um, this Exactly Labs office has a 100 meg link and this, um, my home actually has a gigabit link and despite that, the minimum speed tests are still coming in well below the office speed. And you'll see all sorts of stuff like that. Uh, another thing that we're monitoring on the back end here is um, uh, device uptime. So let's say you have an ISP that's frequently going down, even if it's for about a minute at a time, you'll still pick up on that. And we can even automatically detect ISP outages and, and, and plot that over top of this. Um, so if you want to monitor a particular site's quality, I think this is a great tool to do that. If you're looking to, to um, monitor, for in our case, a set of community anchor institutions, um, this is also a great tool to not just do it for yourself, but to help other people uh, monitor their organization for whatever purpose uh, you had in mind. And uh, thank you so much for your time and feel free to reach out. I'm Michael at exactlylabs.com if you have any questions or thoughts or want to learn a little more. So that is something that I find very exciting, particularly the outage tracking. Uh, so uh, we've been running those in a couple of different locations and getting a sense of it. And it's pretty helpful to tell you, uh, you're not crazy, the internet is going out regularly. This is a device that when deployed properly is hooked right into your the router that is attached to the modem or however you get your internet access. So you're not over a Wi-Fi link, you are connected there and then you set it up and then you forget about it and you can just check the dashboard periodically. It is doing a speed test every hour or you could configure it to um, do it a, a different frequency, but uh, it actually does two speed tests uh, for uh, some reliability and is constantly checking uptime and then reporting that back. So this is very important in areas where people have service that where the ISP claims that it is better than it actually is. And I think that reliability data is gonna be very important over time. We have not seen other devices that allow us to collect that kind of data. And uh, these folks are open to new ideas for how to use these. So uh, if you have ideas, you should feel free to reach out. Um, if you happen to be in uh, rural Texas, rural Michigan, rural West Virginia, or rural Alaska, uh, we can get you devices for free. Um, you can use it uh, in uh, residential or commercial settings. Uh, you could use it in anchor institutions, um, like libraries and schools. In fact, I believe that's where uh, a fair number of them are already. Um, if you are in a more urban area and you would really like a few of these to be able to test something, um, then the cost is currently $110 plus shipping. And that is a cost that we expect to come down over time if the Raspberry Pi uh, supply chain disruption uh, gets resolved. If you have a bunch of Raspberry Pis already and just want to be able to use this device, uh, we can. I think they can help you get uh, the programming that you need to put on it. So uh, there's a variety of, of aspects to this. It's going to become easier and easier for non-technical people to deploy these devices and be able to track this sort of information. So uh, I, I just think this is incredibly important uh, as we actually develop real metrics to be able to demonstrate that people uh, have the access that they uh, are experiencing rather than just what happens to be claimed in a national um, data source uh, because an ISP wrote it there. So that is the conclusion of our main event. Uh, but we have a few important wrap up things. So um, I think if we could get the uh, go, I, let me turn over to Pamela because we actually have a little thing here to go through quick. But we, uh, we do have a survey that we'd really like you to take to help us improve these events. Go ahead, Pamela. Yes, so um, thank you all for joining us at our second event of the year. Um, there will be a few more throughout the year. Um, and I also want to give a huge shout out to Chris for being such a great MC. It's always fun to do these events with you and also for our speakers who gave us their time and knowledge today. Yes, I really appreciate it. Um, you know, these are um, these are folks that are doing really important work. We're trying to select 
um, people that are doing above and beyond to raise them up. Um, you know, I think we want to be able to have a little bit more breathing time to do a little bit more a discussion with folks. Uh, but you should let us know in the survey. I don't know why I'm not seeing a survey link on the screen. I hope I'm not responsible for it. There we go. <laughs> um, so uh, please uh, scan that survey. Um, and we just it should be very easy to do on your mobile device. Um, and uh, I don't know if there's a link in the chat, I hope as well. Um, if you're still in the chat and you could uh, do that. Um, but uh, we really appreciate everyone who came in. I really want to thank NDIA for being a wonderful partner in, uh, in helping us develop content for this. People who filled out the survey when you registered, we are using that for as we think about our next uh, show, uh, which we will announce uh, a date in the next month or so, I imagine, as to when that will be. Um, you can su subscribe to our newsletter. Uh, NDIA has a lot of resources they put on the screen throughout. Um, and uh, we're always open to ideas of, of who to include uh, in these events. Awesome. And if you also want to learn more about the Affordable Connectivity Program, um, there is going to be an event next week that we encourage you all to attend. It's hosted by the New, America, New America's Open Technology Institute, Public Knowledge and Network, and it's titled Closing the Digital Divide, the Affordable Connectivity Program on the Ground and in D.C. It is online. Um, the event is online as well as in person in D.C. It's going to be next Wednesday, June 14th from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. Eastern Time. Our awesome keynote speaker, Angela, will be the moderator for the first panel, and the event will spotlight on the ground ACP practitioners as well as discuss the future of ACP. And we also want you to stay connected with NDIA and join our wonderful community. You'll get access to our monthly newsletter, get access to our listserv that has over um, 2,700 digital inclusion practitioners and advocates, as well as attend our monthly community calls. Our next one is gonna be next Friday. Um, so if you go on our website, digitalinclusion.org um, forward slash join, you're able to apply there. Please send us uh, feedback if you have ideas beyond the survey. Um, also, for people who are really into this, we are doing our Connect This show here in about 35 minutes. Um, so um, that show, uh, if you go to connectthisshow.com, you actually will not see a link to the current show that's about to come up. But the the link, um, you can find it on communitynets.org if you scroll down a little bit to uh, the Connect This Show uh, box. Um, and uh, I believe it's in the chat now as well to check out the YouTube, YouTube stream. That is going to feature... Um, uh, several people, we talk more about infrastructure and that sort of stuff. Um, but we really appreciate you once again sharing your time with us. We hope that you find this informative. Uh, and um, Pamela, uh, I uh, once again uh, appreciate uh, that you are uh, subjecting yourself to 90 minutes of, of being in the same room with me virtually. Uh, it's wonderful to work with you. You do a great job. Thanks, Chris. Likewise. Thank, Thank you, Rye. Thank you uh, to all of our all the folks that uh, made this happen behind the scenes. There's a lot of people that come together to make this happen.